Greetings, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Danny Russell, Vice President of the Asia Society Policy Institute in New York, ASPE. And I'm joined today by three truly renowned experts to help make sense of the implications for the Indo-Pacific region of both the striking Sino-Russian detente, including the uh, February 4th joint statement declaring no limits to the relationship, uh, and of course, the crisis precipitated by Russia's ongoing tragic military invasion of its sovereign and democratic neighbor, the Ukraine. And with me today are three people who I've known for many years and, and greatly admire. Uh, Ambassador Bill Hare Kosikan, who is now at the National University of Singapore after a fantastic career that included serving as the permanent representative to the UN and ambassador to Russia but ultimately the, the top job for a career diplomat is permanent secretary of the Singapore Foreign Ministry. Also joining us is C. Raja Mohan, who until recently was also at the National University of Singapore, and I'm very pleased to say has recently agreed to join ASPE as a senior fellow. Raja Mohan is, is India's most respected foreign policy analyst and someone I've turn to in my own research for his guidance and, and his direction. And rounding out today's program is the Honorable Kevin Rudd, twice Prime Minister and once Foreign Minister of Australia. And the fact that he is my boss is not going to deter me from describing Kevin as a leading and influential analyst of China in particular and Asia Pacific more broadly, whose much anticipated book on US-China relations the avoidable war will be on bookshelves next month, hopefully while war is still avoidable. So many thanks to you, Bill Hari and Raja and Kevin. Unfortunately, um, Alexander Gabua from the Carnegie Moscow Center uh, couldn't join us. So uh, we're gonna have to wait to take a peek into the soul of Vladimir Putin for, uh, what that's worth. Although I, I do remember that when I worked at the Obama White House, uh, then Vice President Biden came back from a trip to Moscow early on in the first term and uh, told everybody who would listen that this Vladimir Putin guy, he's got no soul. So maybe even Alexander can't find it. In any event, um, we've got one hour. I'm going to probe our three panelists, um, but I'm not going to probe them on the events unfolding in Ukraine, as, as riveting as those are. Uh, you've all got your TVs, you know, turned on the cable news with the sound off anyway. So instead, what I'd like to do is to try to examine uh, this set of issues uh, from the perspective of Asia. So um, we'll try to focus, uh, first of all, on the China-Russia relationship and on what that uh, means and what the invasion of Ukraine by Russia looks like and may ultimately mean for the Indo-Pacific region. Before I get started though, let me invite listeners on YouTube and Facebook to use the comment function to ask our questions for the speakers. And as we go, I'll draw from your questions and, and try to get answers from you. Okay. so. Kevin, um, can I start with you and on the China-Russia relationship, what, what do you think we've really learned about the nature of this Sino-Russian entente from the events I mentioned this month, the Putin-Xi meeting on February 1st, 4th, that generated that remarkable joint statement, um, but also the way that Beijing has responded to Russia's attack on Ukraine. Well, thanks very much, uh, Danny. It's good to be here with um, both um, Bilahari and uh, Raja. Um, I think it's important when we look at Russia-China, Danny, to cast it uh, first in a historical frame. Nothing materializes out of nothing. Um, and how did this one come about? I suppose we're up to about phase four of the Russia-China relationship since the Bolshevik Revolution, a long period of collaboration under the Comintern uh, through until 
1949 and then lasting for another decade until the Sino-Soviet split. Um, and in that decade of the 50s, the relationship was, um, was uh, probably the closest we've seen between any uh, fellow communist states and certainly the economic transfer between the then Union of Soviet Socialist Republics and, um, and China was of an order of magnitude not seen before uh, in economic history. Then the Sino-Soviet split, largely arising because of Khrushchev's secret denunciation of Stalin, Mao fearing that this was going to trigger a similar reaction against him within China. And so we entered into this period of the, uh, the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, uh, 30 years or so um, of um, not just drift in the uh, Sino-Soviet relationship, but active uh, border skirmishes uh, as well. And then um, at the time of the fall of the um, Berlin Wall, uh, you'll recall uh, Gorbachev's famous visit to, to Moscow. Uh, and that's when uh, Deng and Gorbachev effectively uh, sealed the deal uh, on the long-standing border dispute between the two countries. And from the Chinese perspective, they made many concessions in order to normalize the relationship uh, with um, the Soviet Union overall. But that period back in 89-91, uh, reinforced by what then happened in Tiananmen domestically, almost at the same time in China, and then this big, deep rift which occurred uh, with the United States over human rights and the rest, led to what I'd describe as the gradual unfolding of the current uh, Russia-China relationship. But of course, uh, this accelerated enormously uh, once we saw the advent of uh, Vladimir Putin, um, the second advent, I should say, of Vladimir Putin, and of course, uh, the rise of Xi Jinping. A point or two about that. Um, this, therefore, is a, a, a relationship with an extraordinarily complex history, not just neighbours, not just shared history, but often conflict-ridden history, right back to Tsarist times. So it's not a relationship without emotion, but the deep pragmatism of these two political leaders has been to shelve all that, particularly in the period after uh, the imposition of the first round of Western sanctions against uh, Russia over the invasion of the Ukraine in 2014, which effectively left Russia with nowhere else to go other than to, as it were, push itself headlong into the embrace of Beijing, financially, economically, and increasingly strategically as well. If I look back to that period back in 2014, while the relationship was normalizing and gradually growing between Moscow and Beijing, it's really that post-2014 period, which has seen it escalate into the level of high strategic collaboration we have today. Two last points and then back to you, Danny. One is um, the extraordinary statement you just referred to, the joint statement of some 5,000 words uh, issued on the 4th of February uh, was, um, and we wrote about it as an Asian Society Policy Institute, quite remarkable uh, in terms of the depth and the breadth of the unfolding strategic collaboration which it confirmed between China uh, and Russia. But in particular, uh, the Chinese did something they'd never done before. They signaled in that joint declaration that they were taking Russia's side against any future expansion of NATO in Europe. Prior to that, the Chinese by and large kept their nose out of European security affairs. And of course, 20 days later, we see the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And so where we land with all of that um, background, uh, Danny, is a China which now finds itself on the horns of a dilemma. That is, this relationship between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, which has become intensely personal, quite close, describing each other as, uh, their, uh, as the best of friends. In fact, they're best friends in international politics. But on the other hand, uh, frankly, the downside for China by locking itself so completely uh, into Putin's corner, given the brutality and the bloodshed which is unfolding in this unmitigated uh, military action against, uh, against Ukraine, is now causing people to think in Beijing that this may be a price which is becoming a little too high. And the core principle at stake, and this is my second and last point, is China, since the 50s, 
has anchored its position in the world, and most particularly in recent times, uh, as being the country which defends to the hilt the absolute sovereignty and territorial integrity of independent nation states. Uh, it's part of Zhou Enlai's five principles of peaceful coexistence. It's what they've used most recently in their um, international diplomatic competition against the United States for who actually is upholding uh, the rules-based system under the United Nations system anchored in the UN Charter, respecting absolute sovereignty. But now they're put into a position because of what Putin has done of supporting Putin at one level, trying to look as though they're not quite supporting Putin through the abstention of the UN Security Council resolution. But at the same time, there's China's standing in Europe takes a beating. China's standing in the rest of Asia takes a beating. And China's standing, even in large parts of the developing world, takes a beating over this as well. Back to you, Danny. Kevin, I'm not going to let you off the hook that easy. <laughs> I have more that I want to ask you. Uh, that the question that's kind of churning in uh, China watching circles in, in the US is what did Xi Jinping know and when did he know it? You know, um, hmm. do we think that Putin sort of uh, pulled a fast one on Xi Jinping when they met at the opening ceremony of the Olympics, kind of the way that Stalin supposedly conned Mao Zedong into greenlighting Kim Il-sung's invasion of South Korea, something that uh, the Chinese uh, Communist Party regrets to this day. Uh, mm. Or what, you know, the, there are some really uh, inexplicable signals, uh, one of which is the fact that Beijing made no move to warn its citizens in the Ukraine, which runs pretty counter to uh, the traditional uh, deep concern about the overseas safety of, of, of their uh, people. And, you know, on day one, uh, the Chinese media to uh, its citizens in Ukraine was, you know, display your PRC flag and you'll be safe. Whereas on day two, they were saying, you know, keep your head down, don't signal your nationality. So there's there's a, a bit of a case to be made on either side and, and kind of neither answer is either clear or really satisfactory. So what, what That's is my your... Theory. Look, the bottom line is, um, Danny, we uh, ultimately, in absent uh, getting a record of the meeting with Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, which may not come to you and I in copy form for some time, um, the conclusion I think we've got to reach is that it is highly improbable that Xi Jinping would have emerged from that meeting without reaching a conclusion that he was, that is, Putin was going to take direct military action against the Ukraine by way of um, his armed forces crossing the border into the Ukraine. And what's the evidence for that? I think the first piece of evidence is um, quite a remarkable piece of continued um, background briefing by American officials uh, into the uh, mainstream American media, uh, again in recent days, of... Um, of uh, discussions held between American officials over recent months with the Chinese ambassador in Washington, saying that they had urged the Chinese ambassador to urge Beijing to, to talk Putin out of this. But then, interestingly, um, the um, briefing, at least through the mainstream American media, is that the United States, presumably using its national technical means, concluded that, in fact, the Chinese were... Uh, uh, simply um, not being helpful and quite the reverse in their separate bilateral discussions uh, with, uh, with the Russians during that period. The second point I would deduce as evidence that Xi Jinping is most likely knew what was going to transpire uh, is simply that uh, Vladimir Putin has so much at stake in the China relationship uh, once the financial and economic pressure comes on uh, the, uh, the Russian Federation uh, following the invasion. He could not therefore afford, in my judgment, to simply leave it to absolute chance that Xi Jinping would have his back without at least giving him some form of heads up. And of course, the final point is this. Um, it is passing strange, I think, in terms of the level of candor between the two leaders, 
that this invasion is launched literally as the dying embers of the Olympic flame for the Beijing Winter Olympics uh, died out and bang, the action more or less starts uh, on the Ukrainian border uh, very soon after. So for those reasons, um, I would think that it's highly probable that Xi Jinping had a clear idea of what was going to unfold. Well, thanks very much for that, Kevin. And I think, you know, your analysis obviously is um, enhanced by the fact that you've been there uh, as a as a national leader uh, talking to uh, foreign heads of state and including on these sorts of uh, tricky issues, albeit not uh, any Australian plans to invade a sovereign neighbor. Bilahari, you served in Moscow a little while ago and you spent an illustrious career uh, uh, shadow boxing, if not more with uh, Beijing. Just staying on this topic of the Sino-Russian uh, Entente, what, what do you see uh, when you look at the developments over the course of uh, either the decade, uh, the eight years that Kevin has pointed to, or even just the month of February? Well, I think first of all, I agree with everything that Kevin has said about uh, Sino-Russian relations. Uh, we'll never know what exactly passed between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin. But it's somewhat beside the point right now. The fact is, China is in a rather awkward position. You can hear th that whirring sound you hear in the background is China trying to readjust its position uh, or mitigate its position. Uh, but I think they are not going to break. There is a strong convergence of interest between them. Neither of them likes a, a Western-dominated world order. However, I think we also should not forget that China is much more invested in at least some aspects of the current order than Russia is. Uh, it is one of the major beneficiaries of the existing order. And while it would want a more dominant place in that order and perhaps even to displace the US from its dominant place, I don't see that China has a strong motivation to destroy it. Uh, I am not so confident about Mr. Putin's Russia. Um, that said, I think um, China is in a very awkward position. It has a lot of explaining to do to itself, to its citizens, uh, to countries around it. And I don't think they have any good answers. Not, not now and not in the future. People are going to look at China People were already going to look at China, were already beginning to look at China with much more skeptical eyes, even if before this happened. And this will raise even more doubts because of the lack of clarity in the Chinese position over the Ukraine. But as I said, uh, they are not going to break. Neither Russia nor China has many. Friends is the wrong word. Many reliable, respect, reliable countries that they can rely on. I don't count the rights of Belarus on one hand, or maybe Laos on the other hand, or even Pakistan on the other hand. Uh, so they have each other. They are stuck with each other. Uh, awkward though it may be. Well, Bill Hari, um, in true Singapore diplomatic fashion, uh, your characterization of, of awkward uh, is a brilliant understatement. Yeah. I think we've seen uh, the Chinese folks. That's our British people. background, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you certainly didn't get it from, from us, from the Australians. Yeah. The Chinese spokespeople have been calling, uh, have, have been uh, really contorting themselves to try to uh, use it lo you know, logical and verbal gymnastics to square the circle that uh, you described and that Kevin described between the much vaunted principle of sovereignty and territorial integrity and what the uh, 
what the Russians have in fact uh, done. Well, uh, Raja, Bilhari mentioned Pakistan uh, just as one piece of the equation, but uh, can I turn to you? Of course, I welcome your thoughts on the Sino-Russia relationship, but also more broadly, the, the Indian perspective, the South Asian regional uh, perspective. What do you think that uh, the Indian policy community has seen and learned now about Russia, about China, uh, and what, uh, what are they doing about it? On the question of, uh, you know, Sino-Russian thing, just a word about that. Uh, Bilahari talked about the awkwardness uh, for a country that talks about sovereignty, territorial integrity, and you have problems in uh, Xinjiang, in uh, Tibet. I mean, you wouldn't want uh, what Russia did. I mean, it's not easy to explain it away. I mean, so there is that problem. But more deeper, if you take a more deeper look, I, mean, I would think uh, it suits the Russians. I mean, if you think of the great power dynamic, that if the Russians are itching to fight the Americans, China is saying, be my guest. That a focus on US-Russia conflict centered on Europe would make it easier, I think, for China uh, to, to deal with Washington. Uh, some signs of it, uh, we're already seeing that. That, uh, that already there are voices in Washington which seem to argue that, look, uh, focus on Russia and that you need to reach out to the, to the Chinese. Uh, and that... Uh, it is better to have some kind of a working relationship with China. Uh, my sense is that the Chinese leverage in all directions has improved, thanks to our Russian friends, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia, which will become a, even more of a junior partner to, to China, and Chinese leverage vis-a-vis -vis Russia will grow. Second, I think it opens some doors for China vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis the US. And for India, that brings me to the regional question. I mean, that actually, uh, in, in fact, uh, strengthens the position, I think, in the near term vis-a-vis -vis India, uh, because for us, uh, the principal problem uh, has been the China question. And in the past, historically, uh, that contrary to the many of our friends in Washington think, uh, view India, India relationship, India-Russia relationship through the lens of the American eyes. But it is really the China question that drove India to the Soviet Union in the 1962 war. And after that, a Sino-Soviet split coincided with the Sino, uh, sorry, Indo-Russian Indo partnership, and the Americans simply walked out of the region. So for us, it was always the triangular relationship. And, and in this triangular relationship, uh, China has become stronger, uh, and the Russian leverage, and we were hoping, many in Delhi keep hoping, somehow the, the Russians will retain an independent role in the region. Uh, but I think locked in a fight with the US and Europe, but they will be a lot more differential. And I think the China, uh, in, you know, there is really serious reports that it was China that pushed Russia to host Imran Khan, uh, that they were really uh, nudging uh, Russia, China, Russia to, to, to deal with Pakistan. So, so I think for, from my perspective, at least from the Indian perspective, I think uh, we end up in a much more difficult situation. I'll just sum up the situation for you. Uh, China can ramp up military pressure on India anytime it wants because we are sitting there and they're sitting on the border. We are face to face. Uh, many people talk about Taiwan, you know, Ukraine and Taiwan, but I would rather look at my own territories where the Chinese can do some salami slicing. And Chinese did this in the Cuban Missile Crisis. So for us, it's not a new thing. Therefore, for us, with our conflict with China, uh, we have much bigger danger that China might do something adventurous. And we depend on the Russians to supply arms. So you can't be in a worse situation. As China and Russia get closer, uh, here we are, uh, vulnerable to Chinese military pressure, but dependent on the Russians for military supplies. So I think breaking out of this, this jam uh, is, the, is the big challenge for India. And my sense is uh, India has moved much closer to the US in the last few years. But tactically, in the near term, the Russian problem makes things worse for us. Uh, Can you well, comment, comment at that point myself? Of course, please. Yeah, it's, um, and I'm going to invite a comment from you, Danny, and uh, completely undermine your position as moderator by asking about the, the United States, uh, which is as follows. A key element of what um, Roger just said uh, was 
that there is reportedly a constituency in Washington which is looking to the possibility of this um, a Russian military action against the Ukraine um, as an opportunity to reopen a deeper uh, line of strategic communication with Beijing in order to place renewed pressure on the Russians to behave. Um, now, that's a crude summary of a more complex proposition. Um, my own analysis for what it's worth is that, uh, whereas I've seen that reported from administration officials uh, in the American media, um, we've also seen reports that Chinese have been spectacularly unhelpful in the lead-up to the Russian invasion of the Ukraine and doing anything about it. Um, that's point one. Point two, now that it's going, as we would say in Australia, pear-shaped, um, that is, it's turning out to be much messier on the ground than I assume the respective Russian and Chinese militaries assured each other it would go. Um, perhaps even the political leadership uh, were assured it would go. <clears throat> I think the idea at this stage that um, somehow after the event that there is a door ajar in Beijing uh, to become more amenable uh, to um, being um, helpful to the United States uh, on the Russia-Ukraine question is fanciful. <clears throat> uh, it's a fanciful before the event. It's fanciful uh, after the event. The die in many respects is totally cast. Um, there is simply too much by way of equities which have been exchanged in this relationship. And given the implications of this factor, that is the US-China dynamic vis-a-vis -vis Russia in that particular strategic triangle, its impact on the Indian strategic perception which Roger just spoke of, I think it's useful we spend a minute or two, um, uh, Danny, reflecting on whether there is any real basis to this view that the United States sees some new openings to Beijing on this question. I think the horse has bolted. Uh, Xi Jinping has concluded that decoupling is underway with the United States and that we're in for 30 years of sustained, shall we say, animus, hostility, conflict, and even worse uh, with the United States uh, and the People's Republic of China. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's important to go to this key premise in the argument. Um, Danny, can I say something? Absolutely. Uh, there may be many good reasons for the United States to try to improve its channels of communication to Russia and try to stabilize its to, to, to China, I'm sorry, and try to stabilize its relationship with China. But the idea that to do that will put pressure on Russia is a complete fantasy. Yeah. Right? Uh, it's a complete fantasy. So you should try to improve your relations or stabilize the competition with China because it's a long-term competition. But if you think that it's going to uh, make any difference with your relationship with Russia, please, you know, stop smoking whatever you're smoking. All right? It's not Thank good you, for So eloquent. But one, one <laughs> other point, one other point which I forgot to make. I see the beginnings, in fact, more than the beginnings, and I've been following this, most closely in my own country and in Malaysia, in Southeast Asia, an attempt by the Chinese, I don't know with or without Russian encouragement, to kind of shift the narrative on the Ukraine. From the fact of invasion to the unreliability of NATO. Yeah. Uh, and that is a new line that I see being peddled in many ways, uh, using the usual Chinese influence Tactics. I'm not sure the Chinese are doing this on their own behest or uh, because the Russians have asked them or maybe a combination of both, but that's something to watch out for because it is a fairly active, uh, attractive line to the man in the street. You know, I mean, NATO has no commitment to the Ukraine and actually NATO and particularly its European members have stepped up much more than I expected them to, Germany in particular. But this attempt to shift the narrative is something I think we all should watch out for. Yeah, I, I very much agree, Bilhari, and uh, I want to come back to that and also come back to more about uh, the, the view from Southeast Asia. Kevin, in, in terms of uh, Washington, uh, I think this, what I'd say at the outset is uh, there's no smoking allowed in the White House. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> now, there are pockets of magical thinking in Washington, no question about it. <laughs> and we've occasionally seen uh, otherwise uh, sab- sober people stand up in front of a microphone and say, China, you really should do this or that, um, with at least the appearance of hoping that uh, that would have some kind of impact. But uh, my observation is that when it comes to the decision makers in the Biden administration, uh, first of all, these are almost entirely veterans of government with a fairly long uh, experience set in uh, dealing directly with the, with the Chinese government. Um, these are people with very few illusions uh, about what is possible, uh, in part because uh, even they, and even in the Biden administration, uh, have been badly disappointed by the, the numerous experiments that they have made in opening channels and promoting cooperation, et cetera, with China. I'm not suggesting that uh, the Chinese complaints are without uh, merit entirely, that uh, the US has taken a very tough, if not hostile, uh, position. Certainly the climate in Capitol Hill and in Washington is not favorable. But I think the decision makers and the policymakers in, in Washington are uh, thinking in long ter- thinking in the long term and, and have no real uh, illusions about uh, wooing or uh, China back or weaning it off of the uh, current tactical relation partnership, uh, or if not a strategic relationship with uh, Russia. However, I think they are also uh, serious about making best efforts to try to open channels that will serve, as Biden calls it, guardrails in the relationship. Um, when I was in government, uh, one of my favorite uh, admonitions to my colleagues was that there is no situation we face that is so bad that we can't make it worse. And I think that within that spirit, um, people in the administration do want to ensure that they are uh, not only able to communicate with Beijing, but also that they're making best efforts uh, to encourage uh, China to uh, adjust its approach to be more responsive to Western uh, concerns. Uh, and some of this, frankly, is, um, is deterrence. But by and large, uh, I think that this uh, experience, the combination of the uh, joint statement, which really brought into sharp focus the uh, Partnership, the emergent partnership between Moscow and Russia in contention with the United States and the West, uh, the common cause and the, the moral uh, support, certainly thus far, that uh, the Chinese leadership is providing to Putin and his invasion of Ukraine, the, in, the really uh, vicious ad hominem statements by Chinese spokespeople uh, placing blame on the United States and absolving uh, Putin of any real responsibility in his aggression and so on. All these things are going to further damage the US-China relationship, not create uh, a a wormhole through the universe that's somehow going to take us to a better place. So I agree with you. Bilahari, you you started to talk about um, what the crisis looks like from the perspective of uh, Southeast Asia. And I'd love to hear a little bit uh, more of that in part because we see predictably uh, such a a variation in responses from uh, within the Pan-ASEAN countries. Well, you know, um, I was, somewhat surprised that ASEAN foreign ministers finally came out with a joint statement. 
it was an extremely weak statement. And it, so that was disappointing, but it was not surprising that it was a weak statement. What was surprising is they had any statement. Of course, each of us have had our individual positions. I think Singapore, if uh, I shouldn't say it myself, but I will say it, we took the strongest position uh, and we have taken a almost unprecedented position of deciding to implement unilateral sanctions against Russia. All right. The details are still being worked out, but uh, the foreign minister of Singapore just announced it this afternoon in parliament. Indonesia has also taken a strong statement, I would say, just after us. The others, well, Myanmar actually supported Russia, but that's not surprising at all, uh, given that it, Russia is its major arms supplier now. And, and of course, nature, given the nature of the regime in Myanmar. And the others, well, they said the right things, but in rather muted tones of voice. <laughs> right? But that doesn't surprise me because Southeast Asia is a, is a very diverse place and some of the ASEAN countries uh, are rather internally preoccupied at the moment with their own domestic politics, their divisions. In Malaysia, I think there is a strong hangover from the Mahathir anti-Western era that is going to take some time to uh, dissipate. And it's almost a reflex, right? What is disturbing to me, as I, began, as I said very briefly just now, because it is actually pushing on a very, an open door in Southeast Asia, is the attempt, I think deliberate attempt, to shift the narrative away from the fact of invasion to... A, NATO is useless, the US is useless, because it has not responded in any meaningful way, which is not true if you follow events, but has a certain resonance if you just take a casual look. Secondly, there is a, uh, a second line, if you like, uh, that it's all Ukraine's fault. It's all the Western fault for, uh, for, uh, for encouraging Ukraine to do things that were actually not in Ukrainians' interest. Now, I, for one, agree that the Russia-Ukraine relationship is an extremely complicated one, going back hundreds, if not thousands of years. And it's not just me. Henry Kissinger wrote a very important op-ed in 2014 after the annexation of India in Washington Post that still bears a, uh, bears a look at. And I think, I personally think, and I have written and I've spoken about it, that I think the expansion of NATO was a mistake. And I still think so. But that's all water under the bridge. Invasion changes everything. The complicated rela historical relationship between Russia and Ukraine, the expansion of NATO, which I think is a mistake, you can argue about that, does not in any way justify an invasion of a sovereign country. So invasion changes everything. Right, and that I think uh, is that message is I am afraid rather diffused in Southeast Asia, uh, because partly because of the internal dynamics in various individual countries, partly because of uh, the dependence on Russia in at least Myanmar, or the ambivalence in Vietnam, which is a bit like in like India because it does reply, uh, it, it does it has a great stock of Soviet era we weapons of which they need Russia to, to help them keep functional, particularly facing the threat they have on China. Yes. Uh, but I think this is something we have to bear in mind. And I think the effort to explain uh, is, has to be stepped up. It is not, it is to a Singaporean, a small country, uh, it is self-evident that you know, an invasion across the border cannot be justified, no matter what. Right, right, but it is not self-evident. This is something that I think a, a bigger propaganda, to use it proper word, effort needs to be made. Right, Understood. there is a, a, Hari, yeah. Europe is self-evident, but it is not. Bill Har, you made a lot of uh, really important points. The two that I'd pull out, and I want to hear from both Kevin and and, uh, and Raja on, uh, are. Uh, the weapons dimension, arms sales dimension. Uh, and Raja, we have a question from the audience about what 
this might mean in the future for uh, India's uh, defense procurement strategy, but also uh, the critical point you made of the uh, aggressive effort uh, from Beijing to try to uh, shift the focus from the violation of Ukraine's sovereignty by Russia to uh, the unreliability of NATO, not only assigning blame uh, to NATO and to the West, but I think more importantly, trying to, uh, at least I think I see the beginnings of an effort to highlight the fact that the United States and NATO were unable to deter uh, Russia and are unable to stop Russia so far. And that fits with the message that uh, Beijing sends to its neighbors, namely that resistance is futile. In, uh, when, I, when I look at the events of this month, what I see is Vladimir Putin basically driving a tank through the biggest taboo of the last seven decades, national sovereignty, with Xi Jinping riding in the passenger seat. And so if you like Japan or Vietnam or the, uh, the Philippines or India, for that matter, if you've been on the receiving end of uh, Chinese gray zone tactics, you've got to be worried that what you're seeing uh, Russia do is to turning is turning gray zone into black and white, into a nightmare where uh, those taboos are no longer going to serve you and help in restraint. But um, let me turn, please, to uh, Raja and to Kevin to uh, weigh in on, on those topics. Any, I think three points. I think one, there is a relationship between what happens in Europe and what happens in Asia. Historically, through the Second World War, through the anti-colonial movements, how you know the US responded to these, the priorities it had to attach to, to Europe over those of Asia, those have not disappeared. I mean, I think I'll be very reassured, and so will be the Japanese, I think. If the US says, look, it can, you know, it can walk in Europe and chew gum in, in Asia, that there would be no division of resources or that US can continue to do both the theaters. I mean, so that is the question, I mean, where Chinese will try and exploit. But I think what we've seen of NATO is actually, uh, thanks to our Russian friends, I mean, I think uh, Germany has been, you know, come out, uh, it's going to rearm itself. Uh, EU has come back with strong response. Uh, NATO seems stronger. So, so I think anyone who can say, actually, thanks to Putin, uh, the Europeans are coming together. Germany is ready to take a larger role. And all the French talk about strategic autonomy uh, is, is actually going to yield to a, a stronger NATO. So... And that, I think, if Europe really takes responsibility for its own security, if Europe does more, then I think it will leave the U.S. to do a lot more things in Asia. So the problem of European security, that burden sharing where, you know, Europeans are not doing enough, but if they do more, I think it will make it easier for the U.S. to do a lot more in Asia. And within Asia, I would say it's an opportunity for India and Japan. I don't know how much of Australia, but that, that for us to take a larger role, that, that we need to do more rather than merely saying how much is Americans doing today. So therefore, I think that gives us an opportunity. When today Abe talks about what's, you know, about the Taiwan question or the Indians talk about the Indian Ocean, for us, I think it's a big moment to step out, take more responsibility, and the U.S. can support us in what we do rather than waiting for the U.S. to do uh, more in the region. And from the Indian side, the last question, I think we're stuck in a, in a path dependency uh, on Russian uh, spare parts. But my sense is one of the things Prime Minister Modi has done is really to emphasize the domestic production of weapons in a big way. Now, these things can't be done overnight. And this will take time. But I think the need for India's strategic autonomy, the much wanted strategic autonomy today, is, it is not the US that is constraining India's strategic autonomy. It is China and Russia. So much of our strategy of the last 30 years that we need to work with RIC and BRICS to limit American power. Today, it's the Chinese power backed by Russians that's going to create us problems. So I think the, the need to produce more and if the Western countries can help us strengthen our domestic defense production, uh, that path uh, can, be, can be shortened. But my sense is uh, that India uh, is finally letting the private sector come into defense production, is asking the Western countries to produce more in India so I think we have a semblance of a strategy, but that will take some time uh, to, to, to bear fruit. Thank you. 
Can I um, back up something you said before, um, Danny, and then you reinforce something which Raja has just said as well? Um, and it goes to the significance of what the government of Singapore has just done. You see, those of us who work in the field of international relations, we've seen crises in the past, we will see crises in the future, and there's a tendency to, uh, as it were, see things as uh, one variation of a theme or another. But this invasion is not that. Uh, this is a very big event. Uh, the Ukraine is a country of 50 million people. Um, it is a sovereign state which is, has full diplomatic relations with the country which is invading it and with China and with the rest of us. And so, as you said before, graphically, um, uh, Danny, driving a tank through the post-45 norms is what this is about. Um, and as a consequence, it is genuinely shocking uh, to, let's call it, the global political class, uh, both in Asia and in Europe, in my judgment, together with large slabs of global public opinion. Look at the turnouts in Berlin, look at the turnouts in um, Amsterdam, look at the turnouts around the world in terms of public protest. Second point is this, to back up um, Raj's point about Europe and to bring China into that equation as well. Europe is enormously strategically important to China, particularly in an age of unfolding US-China decoupling. Uh, it represents an alternative, an additional market, a source of FDI, an access to further capital markets, and in a good season, technology markets as well. And thereby loosening the ties between the Europeans, particularly after the stupidity of uh, Boris Johnson's Brexit uh, and the weakening of the European Union, which occurred as a result of Britain's withdrawal. Um, the Chinese thought though they, they were on to a genuine long-term strategic advantage here. A weaker Europe minus the British, um, softening on China, and therefore creating uh, a second set of alternatives uh, against the primary probability that uh, the United States uh, would be effectively decoupled from China, if not at Washington's direction and possibly at Beijing's direction. But guess what? And this is where this uh, uh, President Zelensky and his extraordinary um, leadership feats for however long on the streets of Kiev um, um, have um, some role, significant role to play, is that the reaction in the Bundestag um, in the Sunday speech by Olaf Scholz on the position of Germany is a speech of the type we have not seen in the Bundestag um, in the post-war period. Um, it is a statement about Putin, about the rebuilding of a Russian empire, about the threat to democracy, about Germany's need to rearm, about going back to the beyond the 2% of uh, GDP threshold, about uh, Germany now providing lethal military equipment to the Ukraine to deal with armed aggression against a sovereign state and a sovereign democracy. So from China's perspective, what has actually happened is the reverse to what China perhaps anticipated with the Ukraine moment. That is a very quick action, rolling into Kiev, game over within a week, minimum bloodshed, regime falls, and let's call it the, the forces of force um, uh, overriding some of the principles of the post-45 order uh, prevailing quickly. In fact, they haven't prevailed yet at all. And instead, the reaction across Europe is exactly what Roger has said, which is actually achieving something which was never achieved in 2014, not achieved with Georgia back in 2007, 2008, and never been achieved in terms of the episodic threats to the three Baltic states either. So this, I think, is causing the fundamental rethink that Bilahari eloquently pointed to before in Beijing, which is this is going badly in the court of international political opinion, including for China. And finally, on the Asian reaction, um, Danny, I think it's um, sobering, uh, as you said before, that if you are looking as, at an, as an Asian country, whether you're in the Philippines, Japan, or the ROK, um, and, and Taiwan is very much uh, a unique case here, but look at the other three, or India, and you're used to, let's call it various forms of grey zone activity. 
Uh, and if you now see China tacitly supporting by its diplomacy and its economic assistance, given what's happening now with sanctions and the actions against the Russian central bank, um, of China tacitly supporting this Russian action, it brings about, I think, perhaps on a slower wind, the same sort of political catharsis that we've now seen unfold in Europe. So this becomes a genuine, genuinely defining moment, I think, in both hemispheres. Uh, and therefore, um, it is not turning out as Beijing, I think, originally assessed, and hence why I think these, uh, the attempt to change the narrative is, is on in earnest. Back to you, Danny. Um, well, all three of you have made uh, really important, fascinating points. Um, and what you're putting a spotlight on is uh, a set of questions and a dynamic. Uh, in the first instance, to what extent can the U.S. demonstrate that it operates in both Europe and Asia, uh, crisis notwithstanding, with uh resolve and with capabilities, um, that this is not a European issue. This is a defining moment in both hemispheres, Kevin, as you articulately put it, that it uh, is a catalyst for middle powers on both continents. And it's galvanizing Germany in particular. It's, a, it's an opportunity Raja, as you point out, for India, Japan, Australia to step up, to do more, and so on. And I think, Raja, what I heard from you is that uh, pushing back against China uh, through a variety of means um, is different than overtly punishing Moscow. And we shouldn't conflate uh, these things, too, that, <clears throat> that Delhi may be... Uh, restrained, shall we say, in uh, joining in the full-throated condemnation of uh, Putin's invasion of the Ukraine. But it would be a mistake to think that that is not uh, really galvanizing India, whether it's on the uh, defense procurement issue or more strategically and making common cause with other Quad members, et cetera. Um, so in the aftermath, is NATO and the Europe, European Union stronger and more united? Um, is uh, Asia, at least at the, shall we say, middle power level, more, uh, more united? We're running uh, low on time. We're coming into the final stretch. And I can't end, uh, particularly Kevin, but uh, Bill Hari and Raja will have views also, asking you uh, just a little bit about the Taiwan angle. You know, there have been some very simplistic analogies made, as I alluded to, between Ukraine and Taiwan, as if aggression is contagious. Well, it could be. It is. As if, as if she, she is going to copycat Putin's invasion or, or strike while the White House is uh, busy tying its shoelaces. Um, Kevin, how, in a nutshell, how do you assess the the longer term impact of the Ukraine crisis on, on the Taiwan question? I'd really, if it's okay, Danny, I'd like to hear from Bilahari first. I've spoken a bit too much. And there's a minute or two at the end I'll come in, not because I'm frightened to join, but I'd really like to hear Bilahari's views. I don't think there will be any direct impact because I think the Chinese know very well that um, Taiwan is far more important to the world economy as an economy in its own right and for the strategic future of uh, Asia. Uh, the US correctly, in my view, made it clear it was not going to use force to defend Ukraine, but it did almost everything short of using force. Now, Taiwan, the US has a policy, long-standing policy of strategic ambiguity, but I think the Chinese know it's a different case. Uh, we can argue about whether the, the policy of strategic ambiguity should be um, over Taiwan should be modified, but I think it's clear enough to everybody with eyes to see that it is not the same situation. Um, 
Mr. Abe gave an interview, I think, was it yesterday or, or today, that he argued quite remarkably, uh, given the, the mood, the general mood in Japan, that you know Japan should consider allowing uh, nuclear weapons to be stationed on its territory. And he also said that uh, the U.S. should uh, abandon its policy of strategic ambiguity on Taiwan. Right? Uh, and this is part of the, of the catalyzing of a new attitude towards security around the world. It's not just Europe or Asia, around the world, to all those thinking people that Mr. Rudd and uh, Raja were, were talking about just a moment ago. So I don't think there's any going to be a, a direct impact. However, I hope there is one impact. I'm not sure, but I hope. I've always wondered and worried about what exactly PLA generals were telling Mr. Xi Jinping about their capabilities vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. Now, it's not going as easily, obviously, for Russia in Ukraine as Mr. Putin and his generals may have hoped. <laughs> right? Uh, so I hope the Chinese are looking at this not just strategically, but tactically and, and thinking again about whatever plans they may have for Taiwan. So a minute or two to follow up, um, given we're short of time, Danny, is one, I agree with Bill Ahari. Um, the commentary fast and loose in various parts of Washington, not the administration, but elsewhere, particularly the Congress, that, um, that Ukraine points to an early Chinese action against um, Taiwan is utter strategic nonsense. Um, the Chinese uh, have a military timetable in their mind for Taiwan. They do not believe militarily they are there yet. As I've said repeatedly and written um, often, I do not believe they'll have that military conclusion this decade. They may well have it next decade. And certainly she would, Xi Jinping would want to resolve it while they're still in power through until 2035. The second thing, though, that the Chinese will look at will be the um, absolute detail and texture of the US and Western response to Ukraine in terms of A, the financial sanctions, B, uh, the freezing of, um, of uh, Russian foreign reserves held in uh, third countries, uh, uh, the suspension of uh, Russian financial institutions from SWIFT, uh, and for the individualized sanctions, which have flowed as well. The Chinese uh, will make an extraordinarily detailed study of that. And the final point, again, is Bilahari's, which is, you know, generals can often predict um, a very swift military outcome. But what uh, Ukraine has demonstrated to us all after one week is this was no shock and awe move on Baghdad. Okay? This was no shock and awe. This has been a much untidier set of arrangements. And when you've got a highly armed country, uh, shall I say, entity like Taiwan, uh, with 25 million people um, uh, determined to defend their own uh, way of life, uh, this, I think, would give pause to some in China about the profound impact which uh, the visuals, the, the video, of um, massive civilian casualties and deaths in Taiwan, which would occur as a result of a full-scale Chinese military invasion some point in the future. Um, and I think those would be the three factors we should bear in mind on the Taiwan analogy, Danny, back to you. Thank you. And if I might just have just three quick points on this. Please. Uh, you know, I think uh, the idea that, that actually China will be restrained, I think, given the famed Russian army, a modernized Russian army is stumbling along in Ukraine. Uh, the PLA, which has no experience of real fighting, uh, assuming that they can simply march in and take Taiwan, I think would be a, a gigantic illusion. So I think the, they would be reasonably uh, more restrained on the part of the Chinese. Second, this notion that the West is in decline, the West is in disarray, uh, which has been propagated, uh, has been thoroughly disproved. Uh, the West is getting its act together slowly, but nevertheless, it's getting its act together. That, I think, is a deterrence. And finally, what Abhisam said, that, that in situ deterrence, local deterrence with nuclear weapons if necessary, so is the Korean debate today, wanting to have nuclear weapons on the soil, whether their own or American, 
this i think is a game changer i think this is fundamentally create local balance of power rather than the americans trying to do everything like a control freak but you let local forces take more responsibility give them more capabilities to balance uh, the dominant hegemonic power wow uh, well um that these are three really profound sets of remarks thank you um raja on the last point uh let's put some energy into aiming for the sweet spot uh that differentiates uh enhanced responsible uh local defense strategies from uh a hobbesian law of the jungle uh we want to avoid that let's hope that the pla is in fact learning from the Ukraine experienced that invasions are not easy and that no plan survives its first brush with reality and let us hope uh frankly that the taiwans are learning that invasions can happen and that the need for deterrence and smart asymmetric defenses to be prepared well in advance is 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 critical but our time has run out i want to thank our three panelists for a really lucid and insightful discussion This program is is one of uh Aspie's many efforts through programs and and policy papers to make sense of topics with real relevance to Asia and the Indo-Pacific uh and to do it in ways that clarify sort of policy options point towards solutions. So I hope all of you will join us for more programs and uh more of our products. So check out asiasociety.org/policy Uh, to see what we've got and what you may have been missing. Thank you all very much.